and again this this thing that my this thing that my buddy had sent me it just got me thinking about that psychological turmoil of war and that sent me into thoughts of another book again another book that I, I read a while back I don't even remember when I read it but I just started thinking about it and this one was about Vietnam and it's it's a classic it's it's called a rumor of war and and again we'll we'll absolutely cover this book on the podcast in detail at some point but I'm kind of just was on this literary tour mode and the psyche I think is just a good view of the psyche that people have in war which again reflects life and there's a, a section in this book where Phil Caputo is assigned to a rear echelon unit he's in the rear and you know he's a lieutenant in the Marine Corps he's in the rear and I think he's in a regimental command post or something but he's not fighting and here's what he thinks of that going to the book in the middle of November at my own request, I was transferred to a line company in 1st Battalion. My convictions about the war had eroded almost to nothing. I had no illusions, but I had volunteered for a line company anyway. There were a number of reasons, of which the paramount was boredom. There was nothing for me to do but count casualties. I felt useless and a little guilty about living in relative safety while other men risked their lives. I cannot deny that the front still held fascination for me. The rights or wrongs of the war aside, there was a magnetism about combat. You seemed to live more intensely under fire. Every sense was sharper, the mind worked clearer and faster. Perhaps it was the tension of opposites that made it so, an attraction balanced by revulsion. Hope that warred with dread. You found yourself on a precarious emotional edge experiencing a headiness that no drink or drug could match. The fear of madness was another motive. The hallucination I had had in the, that day in the mess of seeing Mora and Harrison prefigured in death had become a constant waking nightmare. I had begun to see almost everyone as they would look in death, including myself. Shaving in the mirror in the morning, I could see myself dead. And there were moments when I not only saw my own corpse, but other people looking at it. I saw life going on without me. The sensation of not being anymore came over me at night, just before falling asleep. Sometimes it made me laugh inside. I could not take myself seriously when I could already see my own death. Nor, seeing their deaths as well, could I take others seriously. We were all the victims of a great practical joke played on us by God or nature. Maybe that was why corpses always grinned. They saw the joke at the last moment. Sometimes it made me laugh, but most of the time it was not at all humorous. And I was sure that another few months of identifying bodies would land me in a psychiatric ward. On staff, there was too much time to brood over those corpses. There would be very little time to think in a line company. That is the secret to emotional survival in war, not thinking. Finally, there was hatred. A hatred buried so deep that I could not then admit its existence. I can now, though it is still painful. 
I burned with a hatred for the Viet Cong and with an emotion that dwells in most of us, one closer to the surface than we care to admit, a desire for retribution. I did not hate the enemy for their politics, but for murdering Simpson, for executing that boy whose body had been found in the river, for blasting the life out of Walt Levy. Revenge was one of the reasons I volunteered for a line company. I wanted a chance to kill somebody. And you could see even in that, the, you know, comparing that with the first piece of, of things being a joke and how you just hard, you just get to this point where things just become a joke. How can you take anything seriously? When you don't even know what's going to happen and if you're going to live. How much meaning does life have if you're not going to live it? He gets back out to a line company and now he's on patrol talking about not only what that's like externally, but what it's like mentally psychologically going back to the book I tightened the shoulder straps of my pack heavily loaded with signal flares smoke grenades dry socks a poncho and three days rations an entrenching tool and machete were lashed to its side in my pockets I carried a map compass hand grenades more flares halazone tablets malaria pills and a spare magazine for my carbine a pistol, two clips of ammunition, knife, first aid kit, and two full canteens hung from my belt. My steel helmet and flak jacket added 20 pounds to the load. The gear probably weighed over 40 pounds altogether, but I felt a wonderful, soaring lightness in my limbs. I felt good all over, better than I had felt in months. Even Neil who was not inclined to hand out compliments, had praised my gung-ho enthusiasm before the platoon left base camp. A sudden and mysterious recovery from the virus of fear had caused the change in mood. I don't know why. I only knew I had ceased to be afraid of dying. It was not a feeling of invincibility. Indifference, rather. I had ceased to fear death because I had ceased to care about it. Certainly, I had no illusions that my death, if it came, would be a sacrifice. It would merely be a death, and not a good one either. A good death involved a certain amount of choice, ritual, and style. There were no good deaths in the war. But the manner of dying no longer mattered. I didn't care how death came, so long as it came quickly and painlessly. I would die as casually as a beetle is crushed under a boot heel. And perhaps it was this recognition of my insect-like pettiness that had made me stop caring. I was a beetle. We were all beetles, scratching for survival in the wilderness. Those who had lost the struggle had not changed anything by dying. The deaths of Levi, Simpson, Sullivan, and the others had not made any difference. Thousands of people died each week in the war, and the sum of all their deaths did not make any difference. The war went on without them. And as it went on without them, so would it go on without me. My death would not alter a thing. Walking down the trail, I could not remember having felt an emotion more sublime or liberating than that indifference toward my own death. Again, a a common thought pattern Mm -hmm. is this this feeling of hey I'm in hell and one thing that's gonna set me free is death and once I overcome that 
that, that that just allows me to go and do what I'm supposed to do. And I'm just going to fast forward once again, kind of like uh, with the Will Bird going to the end where where Caputo kind of wraps up his what he's going to bring home from the war. And at this point, he's you know he's obviously survived the enemy. He survived. Actually, at this point, he'd survived a court martial because he'd gotten in some trouble. There was some bad things that happened while he was in charge. There was, you know, cases against him. And he kind of got out of that situation. And now he is heading home. Going back to the book. We stood waiting in the sun at the edge of the runway. There were about 150 of us. And we watched as a replacement draft filed off the big transport plane. They fell into formation and tried to ignore the dusty, tanned, ragged-looking men who jeered them. The replacements looked strangely young, far younger than we, and awkward and bewildered by this scorched land to which an indifferent government had sent them. I did not join in the mockery. I felt sorry for those children, knowing that they would all grow old in this land of endless dying. I pitied them, knowing that out of every ten, one would die. Two more would be maimed for life, another two would be less seriously wounded and sent out to fight again, and all the rest would be wounded in other, more hidden ways. The replacements were marched off toward the convoy that awaited to carry them to their assigned units and their assigned fates. None of them looked at us. They marched away. Shouldering our sea bags, we climbed up the ramp into the plane, the plane we had all dreamed about, the grand mythological freedom bird. A joyous shout went up as the transport lurched off the runway and climbed into the placid sky. Below lay the rice paddies and the green folded hills where we had all lost our friends and our youth. The plane banked and headed out over the China Sea towards Okinawa, toward freedom from death's embrace. None of us was a hero. We would not return to cheering crowds, parades, and the pealing of great cathedral bells. We had done nothing more than endure. We had survived, and that was our only victory. And I think that is important for us to remember that in some cases, some of the things that we go through, some of the things, some of the challenges and tribulations and trials that people get put through, sometimes survival is victory. And all you can do is survive and make it through a situation that you're in. And I think sometimes when people survive something horrible, instead of being happy or elated that they made it through instead they focus on the fact that they got put through it and again I don't I'm no professional at all and there was you know there was there was you know even when I was on Joe Rogan's podcast and and we were talking about Chris Cornell committing suicide you know uh, someone said you know because we kind of devolved into a conversation of hey you know, get outside and Tim Ferriss, when Tim Ferriss was on this podcast, you know, he was saying, you know, get, move and get physical. And so, you know, Joe and I were just kind of talking about that. And, and, and someone came on and said, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. It's, 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 you're lucky to survive something like this. It's horrible. And, and, you know, I kind of said, man, I, I know I'm, I'm not saying that. And, and literally I re-listened to Joe and I talking and both of us, what we were saying was, over and over again, I don't understand this. I don't comprehend it. You, you know, so I don't think that was the intention. Was saying 
oh, all you have to do is go get out a kettlebell and right. you'll be good to go. That's not the intention at all. Mm -hmm. And that's not what either one of us, not only was it not what we were trying to say, we didn't actually say that. Mm -hmm. we, we were saying, hey, I don't understand it. I haven't been in that position before. That's why we brought, that's why I brought Tim on here because Tim had lived through that mm -hmm. and, and knew how bad it was and planned to kill himself. And so that to me is someone that can give their opinion. Joe and I were literally saying, I don't comprehend. Mm. But I think when you get a guy like the author of this book, A Rumor of War, who's, who's talking about their, their victory or his victory and the people on the plane, their victory in Vietnam was survival, was just getting through it. Mm. And I know that's nothing you're gonna be joyous about, but I think at least recognizing, okay, I made it through, now let me move on, yeah. is important.